Welcome, welcome back to Windows Server Administration Fundamentals. I am mm -hmm. Thomas Willingham. I'm Christopher Chapman. And we are here to talk to you. Oh, that's right. Hey, yep, name's right, right down there. Pretty fancy. Uh, oops, technical product manager, information. You had your information up. Module seven, uh, popular Windows network services and applications. Yep, this is our last module. It is our last module, and there is exciting content to be had. There actually, they, I'm not going to say that the other modules there weren't, but there is some very exciting content in this module. Th there are some topics in here I am personally pretty passionate about. That's true. About. That's true. There are some topics for you, and it's, this is a little bit more tangible. It's yes. public facing services, yeah. so it's a little bit more, you get to see the results of your work. Correct. And other people could potentially see the results of your work. Exciting. It really is. exciting. Okay. So let us take a look. First of all, our objectives. Uh, introducing the web server, understanding remote access, yay. Introducing remote administration, yay. And understand server virtualization, yay. So some neat stuff to be had. The World Wide Web and Web Pages. So World Wide Web, uh, most commonly referred to as www or www is a system of interlinked hypertext documents known as web pages that we browse with some form of web browser, uh, such as Internet Explorer. Web pages can contain text, images, videos, pictures of cats, uh, pictures of dogs, uh, blogs, uh, Facebook. These are all examples of Web pages, uh, Bing, Google, tons of things use the web. Very exciting. But a couple things. A couple things use the web. A couple things. The intertubes. <laughs> I do like that title. I yeah, there are one or two things I think use the use the internet. Yep. Yep. Although sometimes the tubes get clogged. The web server. The web. So again, we talk about clients. We talk about servers. The web server is the server that hosts web pages. Uh, when you use your browser on your client, you are connecting to the web server using TCP port 80. Uh, if you want to know more about that process, please see the Networking Fundamentals course. Uh, personal information or security-oriented information can be sent over the internet. So a uh, protocol was developed called SSL, Secure Sockets Layer, which uses TCP port 443. So if you're browsing and you're doing HTTP, and maybe you've gone in to purchase uh, something off Amazon, or you're purchasing something off your favorite site, or Think Geek, or whatever. So you're looking at your favorite site, you go to put in your credit card, and all of a sudden you've noticed that the URL has switched over to HTTPS colon whack whack. Now you're in SSL. So HTTPS designates the fact that you're using SSL. FTP, File Transfer Protocol. File Transfer Protocol is a standard protocol to enable the file transfer of a file from one system to another. Uh, different than HTTP, TCP, or I'm sorry, FTP actually uses two protocol or two ports to operate, ports 20 and 21. So we talked about this in networking fundamentals, but each device on the network has a unique address, a TCP IP address, IP address. Uh, 192, uh, 138, 10, 15. So that's the address. Different services running on the system have different port numbers. So if I want to access the web service on a server, I use port 80. If I want to use FTTP or FTP, I access ports 20 and 21. Uh, for SSL, port 443. So different ports give access to different services on the system. FTP can work a couple different ways. One is 
user authenticated, so username and password. The second is anonymously, so you enable anonymous access. The issue is, is with FTP, username and password are sent over, sent over the wire unencrypted. So if somebody is using a packet sniffer or a network analyzer of some kind, they'll be able to snag those packets, open the packet up, look and see in clear text, username and password. There is a uh, SSL version of FTP, um, which is SFTP or FTPS, adding SSL or TLS encryption to FTP. Another protocol is SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, and this enables one server to send mail to another server or a client to access email from a server. Back in the day, we used to have good times by connecting to an SMTP port. Uh, if you knew the username and password for this, you would put in the username and password, although back in the day, we didn't, that wasn't password protected much. And you could, if you knew the appropriate port protocol, you could create a letter from characters of your desire. You could send a letter to your friend from Santa or the Easter Bunny. Now, I'm not in any way, shape, or form uh, challenging the nature of these characters. I'm just saying they may not email much, so you could take it upon yourself to email for them if that was what you desired to do. Now, this brings us back to demo time. Demo time's always fun. We get to see stuff in action. And at this point, Christopher is gonna demo IIS manager for us. Hey, so Christopher, take us away, please. Give me, give me just a moment. Let me get this demo environment up and up and suitable. All right, so we're gonna take a look at the, again, the 2008 IIS manager. It's not much different than, I mean, it hasn't changed much. So let me get that open and we are all set to go. So here it is, we've installed it. It's there, it's through administrative tools, it's through the start menu. I've actually pinned it because this is my web server. Um, and this is IIS Manager. Um, yeah. Actually, really quick, so IIS Manager is what you use to manage your web services yep. on your system. And it's not just websites, because a lot of people say manage websites. Well, it's not just websites, because it also can be used, as you can see here, for FTP. And it can technically, we get into some gray area when it comes to definitions, but you can use it to manage applications, web applications, which some people would argue are not websites, but I, it's all, it's all accessible via the web. Correct. Anything that is web accessible. So many things, so many things in here. Um, well, this is, this is it. This is a list of sites. I'm actually gonna click here and look at all this. Gives me IDs, gives me um, statuses, gives me protocols, gives me bindings. It is a lot in here, there's a actually, lot. Actually, um, if you go back, it talks about the name, the ID, the status, whether it's running. Yep. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of information in here. Uh, you'll notice started all these are HTTP. There are, if you come over here, I've got HTTPS bindings there, there. So they're created, they're throughout. Um, yeah, this is, I mean, really it's what it is. It's, this is your IIS manager. It's funny that I get to show this right now and I'm gonna close it because this is all we're gonna look at. We just, we saw it, we're good. There is, a new five-day course from Microsoft just on IIS. That sounds exciting. Yep. So if I wanted to take, so we've thrown out these instructor-led courses. If I wanted to take an instructor-led course, how would I go about doing that? What would I need to do? Your best bet, and I can walk people through this if we want to uh, show my screen. Microsoft.com, so yeah, we got a little panda there. I guess Bing has gone, uh, has gone full video. Now this is the, uh, is this the Bing beta? No, this one might be the public, the public Bing. So there you go. Animated backgrounds now. It's adorable. We're just gonna take a moment to appreciate. Yeah, who All doesn't right. appreciate a panda eating some bamboo? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so microsoft.com slash learning will bring you to this page. Find training. 
Now here you can actually get in and look for things by technology. You could go Windows Server, you could go System Center, whatever you want to do. We'll go Windows Server. Uh, your best bet, however, because now you're into just, you get into some, some finer details. Microsoft Training Catalog. And it will take a moment. And I type in IIS. Let's see if we can find the course I'm talking about. If the tool wants to do something. Maybe I can't use the search button in this browser. Browse by product technology, server technologies. Let's see, what do we want to learn about? We want to learn about PowerShell. Now, once you've gotten here, if I change this to classroom training, this is really the key. Windows PowerShell scripting and tool making, Microsoft Windows PowerShell V2 for administrators. Find this course to Microsoft Learning Partner near you. This is what's called the course finder, as we call it. And this is where you find training centers that can provide courses for you based on whatever courses you want to take. Yes, in some previous courses, I've received some email about, well, okay, so I've enjoyed this course, but now I'm ready to go to that next step. And how do I go to that next step? That's exactly the site right there, microsoft.com slash learning. Yep, I did IIS, I did Seattle. I get, all I get is the implementing, administering, uh, that's all. But, you know, for now, oh, and also, this is also radius-based. There may not be, this course is new enough. There may not be any Seattle training centers offering this course yet, so... Yeah. Stay tuned. Microsoft.com slash learning. I'm actually going to look something up because I have to travel next week. Hmm. Stay tuned. Yeah. yeah. So Christopher just demoed uh, using IIS Manager. IIS Manager is what we would use to create a website. Uh, IIS is a role service that needs to be installed. It doesn't. It's not installed by default, so that would need to be installed. Uh, once it is installed, the server will only have the default website, uh, which is a generic page with some languages and some graphics and stuff. Uh, so it only has that default site. You will need to add information if you're creating a custom site. IIS is designed to handle multiple websites at the same time. So if your organization has uh, multiple subsidiaries, uh, each with their own uh, site, and your IT department hosts the infrastructure for those. Uh, using a single web server, it is possible to manage those multiple sites simulta simultaneously. So multiple websites, the default port for a website is port 80, uh, SSL is port 443. To support multiple websites, you can either assign additional IP addresses and assign a website to each IP address. So when I say a website, I'm talking about like www.microsoft.com. Uh, that would be a website or uh, www.microsoft.com slash technet. Uh, these, are, these are different websites, different web properties. Uh, <clears throat> each of those has its own or can have its own uh, IP address. Or conversely, what you might do is one website might have multiple web servers associated with it for the purposes of load balancing. You can also uh, assign a different port. Rather than port 80 and 443, you can assign other ports. You need to ensure that if you do assign other ports that you're not blocking other services in the process. Web server folders, so when you create a website, uh, you can specify a folder that represents the root of the website. So if you go to www.microsoft.com, what's the default directory that is associated with this? Uh, within this folder, you can create subfolders to create a hierarchy that allows you to navigate on the site. Uh, and the subfolders are a virtual directory to be used on a website that corresponds to the physical directory elsewhere on the server or on another server. So the content of a 
website doesn't have to be contained on a single server. Content can be contained on other servers. Applications. An application is a grouping of content on a website defined at the root level or in a separate folder with specific properties such as the application pool in which the application runs and the permissions are granted on the folder. Each site has at least one application named the root application and the reason you need a root application again is if you go to the website you need a default application to be displayed. You need a default page to be displayed. An application pool is a set of resources, uh, worker processes or a set of worker processes to be used by the website or application that defines the memory boundaries for the website. So basically the application pool sets aside resources for the web server. This enables multiple web sites to coexist on a web server simultaneously. And if one starts as a problem, a memory leak, or issue with resources, it won't go outside the boundaries of its application pool. And it basically creates a sandbox for that application. When you go to a website, you access the website, there are default pages on the site that are looked for. Uh, so when you go to the website, http colon whack whack acme .com, it looks for the following files. Uh, default htm, default asp, index, uh, htm, html, or default aspx. So there's multiple files that can be looked for as the default. You can also associate a default file for your website. Yeah, you can put it, it could be hello world.htm, whatever you want it to be. Correct. Or you can, if you've deployed something that comes with its own files that do in fact match the list of default files that IIS is searching for, you can change that file to whatever you want it to be and use the existing default. Correct, correct. So one thing to note is IIS security. Uh, websites are designed to provide information, uh, some of which may be sensitive, so there may be times when you need to protect uh, either some of the data or all of the data, well not all of the data, but some of the data on the site. Uh, you can protect it by limiting who has access to the site, and you can grant or deny specific computers, users, groups access to this content. Uh, you can also use encryption, uh, SSL, for accessing some of the content when uh, the content request is made. So along with IIS security is IIS authentication. Authentication is used, just like connecting to a server, is used to identify a specific user. A specific user uses their credentials, username and password, to authenticate to the system, at which point they might have greater access into the system. Uh, IIS 7.0 supports multiple forms of authentication that are listed on the slide. SSL, Secure Sockets Layers. So what this does is create asymmetric encryption involving a private key and public key to encrypt web traffic. So web traffic typically using HTTP is done in an unencrypted format and again a network analyzer or packet sniffer would be able to use this just view this information. SSL encrypts this information so it's not easily digestible or easy, easily grabbable by someone else reviewing the network. And it has to use a public-private key so that that information can be encrypted in a way that it can be sent out encrypted or be consumed encrypted and still decrypted by parties on either end of that equation. Correct, correct. And it's interesting that uh, Christopher's chiming in here because right now we have a demo from Christopher on SSL. Alrighty, do we now? Alright, well, that's pretty easy. So we're gonna do this. We're gonna go to Microsoft.com. Relatively innocuous. It's a good site. Not SSL. But let's say I want to go to, I don't know, one of my services at Microsoft. 
azure.microsoft.com. Okay, still not a big deal. It talks about trying it, documentation and pricing, all of our good information. But as soon as I click my account, I need to, I need to get to something. Usage and billing or management portal. We'll go to management portal. I don't want to show the world my billing information. Notice something has changed right away. HTTPS. And now that indicates you've switched over to using SSL to a so an encrypted format. Now, this is a little weird because it didn't actually prompt me for a logon. It tried to use my corporate credentials because there is an account that we have that I would use. But I'm going to sign out. Notice just HTTP there for the logout. Now I'm going to go to sign in and see. Okay, there we go. Use another account. And everyone can see my Hotmail address. You can have it. Send me mail. I probably won't read it. I don't check that account anymore. I think it just fills up with junk mail these days. So HTTPS still for the login and after the login for all the management. I'm now in a secure session all the time. So now content that's being sent to and from the site is in encrypted format. Yep. There you go. That's an SSL demo. Banks, Thanks. any credit cards, anything where you're paying a bill, anything where you're logging in, anything where you're sending personal information over the web, putting that personal information into a form, and make sure you're HTTPS. FTP through IIS. So with IIS 7.5, you can manage FTP through the IIS manager, and Christopher demonstrated some of that and showed the different areas that that might show up. Uh, Server 2008 includes IIS 7.0, you can still manage FTP through IIS 6.0. Very nice. The majority of FTP sites are primarily used to download files uh, and typically use anonymous authentication where username and password are not required. But remember, typically, username and password, if they are sent over the web, are sent in an unencrypted format. Remote access server. So it's pretty common for corporations to use remote access server, RAS. This enables users to connect remotely to a network using various secure protocols and connection types. By connecting to RAS over the internet, so from anywhere, users can connect to their organization network to access corporate resources in a secure fashion, just as if they were sitting at work. So some of you, uh, while you work at home, may have a RAS server that you connect to, and then that enables you to access your corporate resources. Another method of connecting to corporate resources is by using a VPN. Where RAS, you connect to a server, and then that server manages the communication system between the client and the corporate network. A VPN, a virtual private network, creates a secure tunnel between your client and your network and shows your client to the network as if you were on the network directly. Uh, links to computers through a wide area network, such as the internet. To keep the connection secure, the data is sent in an encapsulated and encrypted format. And there's multiple methods for doing this. Uh, PPTP, point-to-point -point tunneling protocol. The layer 2 tunneling protocol, LTTP, L2TP. And then secure socket tunneling protocol, SSTP. Again, if you want to know more about these, you can use the Networking Fundamentals course. The VPN connection, so this demonstrates the UI for the VPN connection. Yeah, and I'm going to interject, sorry to jump in here. Go ahead, no, no, no. Usually when we've got screenshots in these decks, we pull them out, I pull them out, and we put in a demo. VPNs are very hard for us to demo in studio and on these machines, so we're just going to show the screenshot. It's, it's really a single click. Once it's been configured, you double click it, you put in a password, you log in. So I figured the screenshot would have to suffice. So we don't have any open live VPNs that we can test from inside the studio. Sorry. But you put in your username, your password, the domain. Uh, some of the properties include what are you going to connect to. 
Um, and then basically you connect to it and boom, once you connect again, you can access your corporate resources as if you were on the corporate network itself. So when you're using a VPN, all traffic goes through your VPN. So if you're at home, you're doing work and all of a sudden you open up a browser window and you, something came up on TV or one of the kids or spouse or whatever said something. Um, and you thought, oh, okay, I'm going to look this up. Typically, anything that you do goes through that VPN, goes through that channel, and goes through work. Well, maybe you don't want that to happen. Maybe you want to be able to use or browse independently of the network. So this, you can do something called split tunneling. So when you go through the VPN, you can disable use default gateway on remote network option. Disabling this option is referred to as split tunnel. And split tunnel enables you, so when you browse on the network, you're browsing from your home network instead of browsing through your work network. Hey, look at this. An essential service, amazingly enough, is remote desktop services. This is where I just check out for the next like half an hour. <laughs> go to town. I, I, am, I am in the zone now. This, this, is, this is really, really exciting. Remote desktop services. Remote desktop services became, kind of got really popular as clients didn't keep up with the operating systems that were coming out. So new operating systems were coming out. Uh, clients wanted to start working remotely, um, and the, the hardware for the clients just wasn't quite keeping up. Hardware was kind of expensive. Corporations didn't want to invest on like new laptops, so they created remote desktop services. Remote desktop services enable a user on a local system to connect to a remote system. So now, so I'm on my local system, here's the remote system. Now Everything is run on the remote system, and just the graphics are sent to the client. This is sometimes referred to as uh, display virtualization or presentation virtualization, because only the graphics is being sent to the client. Uh, early networks utilize dumb terminals, sometimes Weiss terminals, uh, consisting of a monitor and keyboard without a processor. These connected to a mainframe. So as the system would boot up, it would connect to the mainframe and then share a session on the rest of the mainframe with the rest of the systems. Computers kind of an evolution would use Telnet to connect to a server and execute commands at a command prompt and could again share sessions. Remote desktop services formerly known as terminal services, so it flipped from terminal services to remote desktop services in 2008 R2. Fun fact for your friends. So prior to 08 R2, it was terminal services. And this is one of the components or one of the role services enabled by Windows Server. Remote desktop licensing modes. By default, when you have a Windows Server, there are two remote desktop connections that are enabled for administration purposes. Typically, your servers are locked away in some data center or aren't immediately accessible. So for day-to-day -day work administration on that server, you remote desktop in, into it. Then from that console locally, you perform whatever work it is you want to perform, and yet the server is not at that location. It's at a separate location. So by default, you get two licenses for free. And when you do set up remote desktop services, you get, I believe it's 90 days of free licensing to kind of toy with the system and kind of get stuff working. And then after 90 days, the licensing mode shut down. Remote app or TS remote app. 
This is a special kind of virtualization where you're just virtualizing the application. So this is sometimes referred to as application virtualization. So now instead of running or having access to the whole desktop, you have access to just applications. Some scenarios. Maybe you have users that travel or you have users in a remote location that you don't have access to their desktops or you don't manage their desktops directly. So what you can do is give them remote applications that they can access. It runs the applications on a remote system, but it appears that the applications are running on their local system. If you, let's see, take a look at my system. Okay, so on my desktop currently right now is the remote desktop modern app uh, with the modern UI. You can download this from the Windows Store. If we look here, we have a desktop that I can connect to. We also have remote applications. So if we look at these remote applications, say Internet Explorer, and I launch Internet Explorer. So the interesting piece of this, this remote application that I'm running, is Internet Explorer is being displayed on my system, but it's actually being run on a remote system. Uh, this could be for various reasons. Uh, maybe this computer isn't powerful enough to run these. Uh, this could be for security purposes. I don't want uh, data or content to be stored on this local machine, so I want it all to be stored remotely. So I can use remote apps to do that. I can use Word. So now I'm effectively using Word on my system, but again, Word is not being run on my system. So these are examples of remote apps. Okay, so we've looked at some examples of remote application. We've looked at remote desktop modern UI, taking a look at a few of the applications and what it looks like they're running. And honestly, using remote apps are pretty seamless. And nowadays, Microsoft has clients for iOS, Android, and Mac. So you can run that exact same experience on alternate platforms and have true access or access to true native applications running on those systems. Now, that's fine if I'm running locally, but what happens if I want to access these applications over the internet? That's where remote desktop gateway comes in. This gateway enables access from the internet to my desktop resources and applications on my internal network. Remote Desktop Gateway uses RDP over HTTPS, so HTTP with SSL, to establish a secure encrypted connection between my client and the Remote Desktop Gateway. So as you can see, there's a lot of functionality and a lot of really cool stuff going on in the remote desktop services environment. So we've talked a couple days ago about server virtualization. Virtual servers enable you to run, okay, let me step back for a second. Typically you run an operating system on a physical piece of hardware in a one-to-one -one relationship. So I have my piece of hardware, I have my operating system, I run that on top of the uh, on top of that hardware. The operating system accesses the hardware and associated devices directly. Virtual servers enable that hardware to be virtualized. So now you can have multiple systems running on a single piece of hardware simultaneously. And where the benefit in this comes from is statistically a server is idle a certain part of the time. By using server virtualization and having multiple servers running, at any given time, multiple servers will be idle, giving one server access to resources. So through time slicing across these multiple OSs running on a single piece of hardware, you get seamless uh, server access and it appears to people accessing those servers 
as if they're running uh, on their own in their own environment. So this can be done for a couple reasons. Um, one, to get better density on your hardware. So instead of running a single OS on your hardware and it being uh, underutilized, it being idle a uh, large percentage of the time, now you can run multiple OSs on that hardware simultaneously and get better usage of that hardware over a given period of time. You can also use uh, system virtualization to enable test systems. So you can create a test system, get a test environment going, use it. Uh, you can create uh, basically certain points, take snapshots of certain points during the test process. Uh, this test ran successfully. I'm going to go ahead and snapshot that point. I'll develop a bit. Things went awry. Now I can roll back to this and continue on. So it, it allows you to create snapshots at any given time and then roll back to those snapshots. Microsoft's implementation of a virtual server is Hyper-V. Uh, it's a hypervisor-based virtualization system for x80, or I'm sorry, for x64-based uh, computers starting with Windows Server 2008. The hypervisor is installed between the hardware and the operating system and is the main component that manages these virtual computers. To run several virtual machines on a single computer, you need to have sufficient resources on the system, uh, processor, memory, uh, hard drive, to support this increased load. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, since most servers sit idle, virtualization creates a better density and uses the server's hardware more efficiently. So to install Hyper-V, you need a couple requirements. You need a 64-bit version of 2008, a 64-bit processor and BIOS that support hardware-assisted virtualization. Uh, it talks about Intel VT or AMD V technology. Uh, and then you need hardware data execution prevention which Intel describes as executed, disable, and AMD describes as no execute, uh, used in CPUs to segregate, to create sandboxes of memory for use by either the storage of processor instructions or for storage of data, uh, again, to create virtual sandboxes so systems aren't stepping on each other. So I talked about virtualization, remote desktop services. I've talked about virtual servers. Uh, we've talked a bit about Hyper-V. Now we have a demo for Hyper-V Manager that Christopher can take over. I've been over here being all excited about remote desktop services and what's available. Uh, Christopher, why don't you take a little test drive of Hyper-V Manager? Show I us what that's about. I suppose I can manage that. So um, I've, I've got it up and running. Hold on just a second. Let me, uh, let me change this real fast. Hide my taskbar so you don't have to look at that. Here's Hyper-V Manager. One of the nice things I like about virtualization, one of the nice things I like about Hyper-V is it's, I hate to use these words, it's simple. Well, let's, let's take out simple and say straightforward. That'll work. You open a console, you install the role, you do a restart, you have one console, it's right here. Everything you need is right here. New virtual machine. Let's create one just for fun. Test MVA VM. Store in a different location. I'm gonna put it on my E drive. Five twelve memory is fine. Networking. Let's give it a connection. Let's connect it to private network. Virtual hard disk defaults. Great. Let's leave that as is. OS later. Finish. I'm done. Okay. So what did you effectively create there? Did I just created a computer with no operating system on it. Okay. So I couldn't log into that and use it as a computer yet, could I? Not yet. Okay. But right click. Settings, go to my optical drive and tell it to use an image. Uh, no, not that one. Browse, E, software, where do I have, right here. Let's work. This is old, an old build, but it'll work. Now, if I start this, Comes up, should give me a prompt. 
Um, yeah, like I said, this is an old build, so. So even though this I may not be able to get much past this screen, I'm not sure I'm supposed to show old build bits. This is even though this is a virtual machine, uh, it's still going through the process as if it were a physical machine. Of you have to set the machine up, you have to install an OS, yeah, you have you to wanna, configure the OS. If you want to look at my screen real quick, this is the setup screen for Windows because I attached that ISO. I run through this, I have a computer ready to go, just as if I'd put a physical box on my desk, plop the DVD into it, installed Windows Server. Done. So the couple components of this is one, there's a VM, the virtual machine. The virtual machine describes the overall configuration of the machine. How much RAM is associated to the machine? Uh, is the drive fixed or dynamic? Where is the hard drive stored? So that's information for the virtual machine. Then associated with the virtual machine is a VHD a virtual hard drive, and on that is the hard drive associated that runs the operating system, that stores data, yep. things of that nature. Yep. And that console, I mean, Hyper-V is an incredibly powerful tool that is, again, relatively straightforward to set up and start using. And it's in a similar fashion that you can start creating virtual machines in the cloud. So now instead of having a virtual machine on your physical system, you have a physical machine, well, a virtual machine that you can run for development, for web services, for whatever out there. I am, in fact, running a website on a VM in Azure as we speak. Very nice. Yeah, it's kind of, nice. it is actually, it's, it's pretty fancy. Uh, if you want to play around with this, you can actually go to uh, Azure, the Azure site, and sign up for a free trial. So you can get your hands on this and kind of play with it yourself and, yep. and see what you think. Create some virtual machines. And those VMs are even easier because we have pre-built images for OSs. So you actually pick what you want, click a button. Two minutes later, you've got a VM OS ready to go to log into and work on. So you could be developing. And, and this is one of the things that uh, companies are starting to use it for. They're taking the focus off managing infrastructure and managing physical systems, and they're putting the emphasis on getting people access to their work. So removing the complexity of the infrastructure, of managing systems, and just throwing people right into, hey, here's a workstation, here's the environment that you need. Maybe it's complex. I don't need to worry about setting up the complexity of that on site. I don't need specialized hardware. I put it in the cloud. You access it. You're good to go. Yep, I was up and running from nothing to fully functional, essentially a photo gallery website running on a VM in the cloud in about five minutes. That's pretty dang cool. Five, five to 10 minutes, I think is what it took me. And there's a trial, so initially you could do it for free. Yep, 30 days. Integration services, so locally running Hyper-V, some of the Windows built-in drivers uh, have issues playing nicely in the Hyper-V environment. I find not so much anymore. Uh, I find with the later versions of Hyper-V 2012, 2012 R2, that it's a lot more seamless. But initially, some of the drivers didn't run well. Uh, an example was you'd put your mouse in the virtual machine, and then it would get trapped on the edges, so you couldn't get your mouse out of their virtual machine without typing in some weird key process. Uh, like shift control up or something like that, and then that would free your mouse out of the environment. Integration services was a add-on uh, service that you could install that would kind of overcome some of these issues. Consolidation. Uh, we've talked about density and utilizing server hardware uh, more fully, more efficiently. Consolidation enables uh, the access of or the collapsing of multiple physical systems into uh, single hardware. Microsoft System Center Virtual Machine Manager, so VMM, uh, enables you to convert existing physical computers to virtual machines. So you can take systems running on older hardware, and instead of buying a ton of new hardware, you, one, might push the stuff up to the cloud, or two, if you're not ready for a leap to the cloud yet, buy one or two bigger horsepower servers and collapse four or five, however many servers that you want to, collapse those into a single server. 
We talked about disks. So when you create a virtual hard drive, you need to configure whether it's fixed size. So this takes up a fixed full amount of disk space when created. It's 100 gigs. It's always going to take 100 gigs. Even if there's no data on that disk, it's still going to take 100, disk, 100 gigs. Uh, a dynamically expanding disk, you create at a certain, and you can create, this is minimal, this is maximum, uh, and it starts off at your minimum and then just expands and adds additional space as it needs. The nice thing about a dynamically expanding disk is it takes less uh, space. So it only takes up the space, well, a, a little more than it uses, but it, it takes less space because it's only using space that it actually uses. Snapshots, I've talked a little bit about snapshots already. Snapshots is uh, taking a configuration uh, settings and configuration resources of a machine at a certain time, copying that over uh, and creating a duplicate copy of it. Uh, this is one of the benefits of virtual servers is you can get it configured a certain way, uh, take a snapshot of it and say, hey, that's how I want to run it. Uh, maybe duplicate that for a test server and kind of play around with it. And if you don't like it, you just trash it and go back to your original snapshot. Um, or let's say you're uh, testing patches, you're testing new applications. You can do it if things don't go right. You can roll back to your original snapshot. Uh, with Hyper-V, you can create up to 10 levels of snapshots. Uh, and it just creates folders with uh, associated date and times with it. Now I'm not only sad, I'm really sad. Oh, yeah? Uh, because now... We're not only at the end of the module, we're at the end of a course. We've made it to the end of MTA Windows Server Administration Fundamentals. Uh, th yeah, this is, this is it. Um, I, I guess we're finished. We are. Well, for today. For today. We've, for today. We've got plenty more. There's, there's more to be had. There is. So I guess at this point, um, it's almost the weekend, so... Um, I've had my hat there uh, waiting. It, it's kind of been our little mascot, and um, now I guess we're ready to go. I we guess are. it's time to head out. And to enjoy, even though we're not supposed to talk about dates and times, a holiday weekend. It is a holiday weekend. We it won't is for say us right what now. When holiday. you're watching this, it may not be a holiday weekend, but for right now. But yeah, I, do we have anything else? Um, not that I can think of. Watch uh, it again. And then watch networking again, and then watch security again, and then watch all the others again. You could, and there's a lot of other uh, courses on MVA to take, uh, a lot of excellent courses to gain some excellent knowledge. Um, and one thing I haven't used for a while is price is free. And effectively, this is like a big hug of knowledge for Microsoft. It I haven't is. used hug of knowledge for a while. And then if you want more, oh, that's a weird analogy to travel with. We have instructor-led courses, we have books, we have exams, we have, and there's learning everywhere. There is, and if you're, if you're thinking, oh, well, I don't have the environment to practice in, I, I don't have, play with Azure. Get, your, get some virtual machines going, play with this stuff. Full Hyper-V in Windows 8 and 8.1. In the clients, that's right. Build some, build some VMs right. in the client, you can do it. I think so, that's all. We got anything else? I can't think of anything. Uh, have a good one. Thanks for joining.